And you know, where does the where does the aroma actually come from in cannabis? Typically, typically people talk about these things called terpenes. And so, what uh, what kind of contribution are the terpenes making to the aroma? And you know, what are some of the question marks there? Yeah, and and so this is a great question and one that um, you know we've been hammering away at everything but terpenes. But that's not to say terpenes aren't important at all. Um, you know, as you showed in your paper, <laughs> there's a there's a wide variety of kind of major terps that can produce the aroma of cannabis, um, but they don't necessarily describe the aromas as specifically as we'd like. Uh, and one of those one aspect of that is for a long time people didn't really understand that. Uh, what people call gassy, gassy cannabis or skunky cannabis, that kind of that smell that everybody kind of knows. Um, there wasn't not, there was not a clear understanding about what is the chemistry behind that specific aroma um, that cannabis produces. And so again, kind of going back to how I was saying that a lot of folks were, um, you know, abstract started trying to look at, uh, you know, what, what do we, what, what can we do differently that other people are not looking at? Well, within the aroma of cannabis, like you mentioned, a lot of folks were looking at terpenes. And the main reason that is, is because they are the most, uh, you know, the highest concentration compounds, you know, in the volatiles in cannabis. And so, you know, those include beta myrcene. They're usually typically very high in OGs. Uh, hemp is almost always myrcene rich. Um, you have caryophyllene, which is a sesquiterpene. It has a more muted aroma because it is heavier. It's a larger molecule than uh, beta myrcene or you know the pinenes, uh, but it's in many different things as well. Uh, you know, limonene, D-limonene, we see that in basically every variety, uh, and it can be dominant. Usually, typically in hybrid varieties, uh, they tend to be present in greater concentrations, um, or at least what people would consider to be hybrid. Um, and then you know, linalool, geraniol, you, you see all these sort of things and. Uh, I, I do want to say something here. I think this is, you know, the, the terpene world, I think there's some, um, not necessarily misinformation, but people may be kind of like assuming things that are not necessarily correct. And that is that if you do not see <clears throat> some of these terpenes on a COA label or on the packaging label of your product does not mean that those other things are not there. And so what I mean by that is in our analysis using this 2DGC, we've optimized the methodology to basically have a very wide dynamic range to see all the high concentration compounds and low concentration compounds. Um, And I'll explain why the low ones matter just as much as the high ones in a bit. But we basically always see if you have like, you know, a COA that says we test for 18 terpenes, oftentimes we'll get these tested at a third party lab just to see what they say things look like. And they'll have a lot of non-detects for the many of these compounds. Uh, but what we find is actually they're almost universally in these varieties. They're just in levels that are a bit too low, maybe for their methodology to see. But the way we work, we want to see that whole range. And so we've tuned our methodology to see it. Um, and so that is something I want to mention that I do think there's this, uh, you know, kind of misconception that if it's not on my COA and if it's not on my label, it's not there at all. And that's just not true. Um, but again, you know, we are interested in, well, okay, everybody's looking at the major terpenes. What about all this other stuff kind of in the lower concentration? And so, uh, and this is related going back to what is that skunky gassy aroma? People have been talking about the major terpenes for so long that if it was one of those, this question would have been answered a long time ago, but obviously it hasn't and it wasn't. Um, so, so, so what a you're lot saying people, is, is what you're saying that none of the individual terpenes that are commonly found in cannabis smell like that skunky smell? Not at all. No. And so, like I'd mentioned abstracts, you know, we, we, a large part of our business is flavor and aroma based. Right. And so we have basically every major terpene, even many, many, many of the minor terpenes um, in our lab, in our flavor lab. And so we can go in and smell these one by one. And so if you were to ever swing by our lab, Nick, you could do the same thing. And you would, you would obviously say this, none of these smell like cannabis or like at least that scent that we're all kind of after. Um, and so, you know, I think that's the benefit of our business model is that we're able to leverage basically the, uh, the flavor side to kind of validate the chemistry that we're seeing, uh, you know, spat out from our instrumentation. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, when you're focusing on, there's many sort of different 
aroma notes that you can often smell in different cannabis products and different strains and things. This gassy, skunky smell, why is this one particularly important? Do, do consumers tend to fixate on that? Is there an association that's made in people's minds between like the potency or the quality of the product and that particular aroma note? Or you know, why, why, is, why is this one so interesting to focus on? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think many people who consume cannabis do use this specific scent. It's this very, it's such a pungent smell. Uh, I, well, when you can get it that fresh, it's that, you know, it's very pungent. Um, but they use that as essentially a quality marker to their nose to say, is this high quality cannabis or not? Right. Is this, um, you know, is, is this gas weed, right? Is this going to make me feel a certain way because it has this aroma? And, you know, it's funny because they're not necessarily wrong because what we found in our studies is that these compounds are at the greatest concentration when the cannabis is fresher. So, you know, I mean, people aren't necessarily wrong about that, where if you smell something and it is very pungent, it probably is a fresher product than if, you know, you smelled something and it had a, a lower amounts. Now that's not to say all varieties produce these equally because they don't. And that's a whole nother, you know, a whole nother story. Um, but the point is that if people really enjoy this aroma, and I think they do that because it has this sort of, um, you know, this time dependent manner uh, as to the pungency of it. Uh, you know, folks, uh, that, that's the reason folks have really like honed in on it. But I also want to mention that I think there's another important kind of flip side to this coin here. So, you know, that those are folks who consume cannabis oftentimes want this really intense aroma. But a lot of folks who don't consume cannabis, I would say, are equally as kind of, um, you know, it's a nuisance odor to them. Right. Mm -hmm. And so in that context, understanding the chemistry of, you know, this aroma within cannabis is probably the most important one to understand because a, it's extremely diffuse, uh, meaning that, you know, you open a bag of cannabis, it's going to smell your entire room up, especially if it, you know, there's a lot of these compounds in there. Um, and so that means that, you know, cultivators, breeders, uh, even if you live in an apartment complex, right. Uh, this aroma is going to get around. And for people who don't consume cannabis, oftentimes it's described, like I said, as a nuisance odor. And so, you know, that could have implications for zoning laws, policy, um, as well as potentially, you know, would do, do people suspect, oh, well, I can smell this in, in my apartment. I'm getting high from it. You know, there could be actually, uh, even though that's totally incorrect, you know, there could be this sort of um, these sort of issues kind of for non-consumers that I want to mention as well. And so, you know, you mentioned that no individual terpene smells like weed, basically. And, yeah. you know, that's that's pretty well known to anyone who's ever smelled these things individually. And the explanation there that people have, um, which is not unreasonable, is, well, you know, the olfactory system is complicated. There's lots of non-linearities involved in how our mm -hmm. brains construct the perception of of what we smell from the individual chemical molecules floating through the air and, and getting up our nose. So even though no individual terpene is responsible for like the core weed smell, at least that skunky smell, it's really the combination. So there's some particular constellation that might be associated with that smell. And it's really about the, the profile of all the terpenes. So has anyone been able to show that like different terpene profiles, different combinations of terpenes are associated with perceived quality or potency or this particular aroma or anything like that? So I think that comes down to user preference. So, uh, you know, in your paper, Nick, you showed a really nice figure that basically grouped many varieties that are rich in D-limonene, caryophylline, and myrcene kind of in the same bubble or the same kind of, uh, you know, group. But then you had these, you know, what people would consider to be kind of sativa varieties uh, in their own sort of classification. And I think in that respect, those actually terpenes do dictate those differences right there. Um, and from that perspective, I think that just depends on, well, what do you prefer? Right. Um, but yes, in, in, in those situations, obviously the terpenes are mixing together to produce specific types of aromas. Um, so in the sativa rich varieties, they're nearly always terpenaline rich, and they have a very characteristic uh, sativa aroma. So a lot of hazes, a lot of jacks, 
those sort of things, they all kind of have the same sort of background aroma to them. I will mention that they're very rarely skunky. They're kind of the outlier here in that context. Um, but everything else kind of runs together. Uh, but you can still have that kind of characteristic uh, skunky back note that's in there. Um, and so you're, you know, and so your, your question of do these things mix together to produce specific scents? Yes, but we're actually working on another paper right now that's going to basically kind of shed much more light on this in the context of the sensory aroma uh, um, perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so I think this, this next paper is going to be a follow-up to this one that just deciphered the skunkiness, but this next one's going to look into all, many other varieties of uh, aromas that this plant produces. And I think it'll be very enlightening as to what is the actual impact of the major terpenes, even the minor terpenes, and then potentially all these other things that exist in cannabis as well. So, so it's a fair restatement of that, that if you've got two distinct terpene profiles and two different cannabis strains, yes, they will have different aromas. You'll be able, mm -hmm. you will be able to smell a difference between them. And that is coming to a large extent from the different terpene profile in, in one versus the other. But it's at best not clear that that sort of skunky, gassy, pungent smell that is uh, very strongly associated with, with cannabis, is it's not clear that that's coming from any particular terpene profile. Yeah, no, and not any particular combination of them either, right? Like you mentioned, you know, the olfactory system is incredibly complex and people are just now starting to kind of understand how things work on a molecular level. There was a paper just published in Nature a few weeks ago that they, they finally uh, worked out the crystal structure for one of the olfactory um, receptors in the nose and they were binding a fatty, fatty acid to it. And so, that okay, that's, that's one receptor. How many more are there in the human nose? But you're right that basically what we showed is that these things do not, uh, these terpenes do not combine in any way to create that aroma, that skunky aroma. So... So in the, the essential oil of the plant, which produces all of the compounds of interest, basically, it produces mm -hmm. the cannabinoids like THC, which is where the psychoactive effects are primarily coming from. It produces volatile compounds like terpenes that float through the air that contribute to the aroma. You mentioned that the terpenes are the largest class of chemical compounds in the essential oil that are volatile, that are you know floating through the air. And then, of course, cannabinoids make up uh, a big fraction of the essential oil, but they're non-volatile. Yeah. And you guys have sort of looked at other stuff in there that's not right. as abundant, um, but maybe important in different ways. And so wh why did you start to do that? And, and what are some of the key classes of compounds beyond the cannabinoids and the terpenes that are in that oil? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's exactly correct. Basically the cannabinoids make up the majority of the essential oil content. Then you have terpenes that are usually like on in, cured in fluorescence, maybe one to 3%. And then there's everything else. Everything else might total up to be 0.5% of the total mass might be. Um, but within there, there's hundreds of different compounds with different classifications as far as their functionality. Um, and so, for instance, you know, there's 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 already been a few papers that have been published looking at um, kind of what are those other compounds. And so, you know, there's esters are known, alcohols are known, uh, ketones are known, aldehydes, all these sort of things. Uh, but again, these variety or these compounds, uh, if you go either look at the aroma descriptors on like the Good Sense chemical database um, or PubChem. And you look at them, none of them will have that specific aroma that you're referring to, the skunky, gassy aroma. Uh, and so, you know, esters tend to be fruity. They tend to be, you know, they, they actually are essentially, you know, the drivers in many fruits uh, as to their kind of, you know, unique, unique flavors or tastes. Um, aldehydes are typically kind of sharp. They're more top notes, uh, but they're still not going to have that, that pungency that we're talking about with the skunky, gassy aroma. Yeah. And so... There's one other class, and so this is what we published on, and it was these uh, volatile sulfur compounds that we ended up finding. Okay, these are the ones that look like they could be the correct identification uh, as far as the chemistry behind that aroma. And you know, in our paper, we describe how we did that. So, so what exactly are volatile sulfur compounds, and where do they show up in nature outside of cannabis? Yeah, so VSCs are found in many different plants. Um, they're in some vegetables. Uh, 
they're in some uh, herbs, they're in some fruits, uh, as well as they're in <laughs> kind of unpleasant sources of smells. Uh, they actually add, uh, I think it's um, hydrogen sulfide or one, one of the very small sulfur containing compounds to natural gas because it has such a low odor threshold. If there's a natural gas leak, you can smell it because natural gas by itself doesn't have an aroma. So they add a tiny, tiny, tiny amount to that so you can detect it. In nature though, um, so there are, I, I like to point out that there's animals as well that can produce this smell. So skunks can produce the smell. If you go look at the chemistry of their aerosol spray, they produce, I think it's like 20 to 30 different compounds that actually create that aroma. Um, but then, like I mentioned, some vegetables also produce it. So things like garlic produce mm. them, uh, onion produce them, uh, hops produce them. Um, and they're all different. They're all kind of chemically specific to whatever plant that is. So even though onion and garlic are in the same family, this, um, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, I can't remember. <laughs> Allie, Allie or something. Allie, they're elacious plants, right? Um, they produce still chemically distinct compounds that contain sulfur. And that's why they don't smell exactly the same, but they do still have a sort of pungency to them. Uh, same thing with skunks. They're kind of chemically specific. And then in the fruit world, actually, there's some really cool uh, kind of usually typically tropical fruits that can produce these sort of scents. And so one of them that, you know, here in the U S I don't know if people are as familiar with it, but durian, which is very popular. It's a fruit, uh, over in uh, Asia uh, is extremely pungent. Uh, so durian produces, people have looked into it quite a bit because it has such a noxious sort of smell, um, but it produces at least five or six different VSCs that each have kind of off-putting aromas. And it's so pungent that uh, there are hotels over in Asia that actually have signs on the front doors that say, do not bring durian in here because it smells so bad that it'll essentially stink <laughs> up the ho hotel. Uh, but then there's other things that are pleasant in the fruit world, such as uh, passion fruit. Um, so some of these tropical fruits that, you know, you think of maybe putting in like a mojito or uh, some sort of mixed drink, um, those oftentimes actually have a lot of their really um, pleasant characteristics are derived from VSCs.